I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. In episode 18 of Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, we learn that Revelation is the only book of the Bible which contains a promise of special blessing to those who read it. In Revelation 1 verses 3 it says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. God promises all the readers of this book a special blessing if we read, hear, and take to heart the words of this prophecy. The blessing is that we will be comforted, guided, and have assurance even when the world around us is troubled and confused, putting us under pressure and stress as described in the book of Revelation. The days are growing darker as we near the conclusion of history, but the believer who understands the book of Revelation will have an anchor and guide through the last troubled times. No other book in the Bible is like Revelation. It is unique. It is the final revelation from God. There is nothing after this. We are sure that God's will for mankind is now fully revealed and known. But Revelation is not a closed book like Daniel. It is meant to be understood and there are blessings for those who read it and take it to heart. One personal discovery I did make while preparing for the series is that in Matthew 24 verses 36, Jesus said, Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Jesus admitted that although he did understand many of the events of the last days, he did not know the time when it would all happen, at that time. That knowledge belonged only to the Father. However, now risen and glorified at the right hand of Father God, Jesus must now know all those things. Jesus then passes it on to an angel, who in turn makes it known to John, through symbols, what is in the mind of God. A doxology is a short hymn of praise to Jehovah God in various Christian and Jewish worship services. It is a word that comes from the Greek word doxa, meaning glory, and logos, meaning word or speaking. It was often added to the end of psalms and hymns and often practiced in Jewish synagogues and in the Christian church during the first century. Revelation 1 verses 5 to 6 says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. This is the first doxology of this book, and it makes three points. Firstly, he loves us. This verb is in the present tense. It is not past tense. He did love us, that is what John 3 verses 16 tells us, but Jesus also loves us now. That is exactly the point that John is making. Everything in the life of a believer should be based on the present love of the Lord Jesus. Even though we know deep down in our hearts that we are faithless and foolish and often arrogantly sinful and selfish, He still loves us. We all need to ask ourselves the question, Is my love for Christ based on His historical love and what He did for me in the past or what others have told me, or is it an eternal love of Him being involved in my life all the time? This speaks to us of a truth that is often misunderstood. Although the work of Jesus on the cross is finished, His work in the hearts and lives of every believer is an ongoing process, never ceasing or finishing. Secondly, it says Jesus has freed us from our sins by His blood. He breaks the chains of evil habits in our lives. He sets us free from the dependencies that we have allowed to bind and limit us. Drug dependency or alcohol dependency can get a terrible grip on our lives. And there are many other dependencies that can hold us captive. Money, status, power, sex, pornography, social media. These are just some that pop into my head right now. Here Jesus declares that he is the one who frees us from our sins. We are all sinfully dependent people. 
we are all bound by evil of some sort or another. Selfish attitudes and hot tempers or lustful passions or angry self-centered talk. We are all as much victims of evil as any alcoholic or drug addict may be. But here is one who has freed us by the sacrifice of his own life. Thirdly, Jesus has made us a kingdom of priests to serve the Lord our God. We are not kings, but priests. The kingdom is the area of God's rule, and we are the priests in this kingdom because we share in his ministry. In Old Testament times, the priest's ministry was to remove the sense of alienation which people felt with God. Sinners do feel estranged from God. They are cut off by their behavior from a God of holiness and justice, but they are to be brought near by priests. In the Old Testament, the priests explained the meaning of the sacrifices and thus brought people near. That is the work of believers today. For this work, Jesus has made us a kingdom of priests. Do you ever think of yourself as a priest? That is what God has sent us to do. Revelation 1 verses 7 to 8 tells us how Christ will return. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, including those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. This is so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is and who was and is coming, the Almighty. Jesus has introduced us not only to who he is and what he does, but also what he will do in the future. Look, he is coming with the clouds. This is the crescendo of history that the whole earth and its inhabitants are moving towards. Christ's coming will have a universal impact because Every eye will see him. Jesus himself tells us this in Matthew 24. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This event will not be missed by anyone. There will be no need for a television set or cable TV or social media. He will appear everywhere in that unique power of God to be visible to everybody all around the earth at once. The Apostle Paul tells us about that event in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 and describes Jesus' return as the splendor of his coming. In Greek, this literally means the outshining of his parousia. Now this word parousia is one of those strange Greek words that doesn't have a single equivalent word in English that describes its true and full meaning. In Greek, parousia primarily means presence. It literally means being alongside or appearing. In ancient Greek times, it also had a meaning of an arrival or an occasion or a visitation by a high official. I think the best way to describe it is the feeling that you would have if you were to be unexpectedly visited by the Queen of England. You might not see her or speak to her, but you would be aware of her presence and the atmosphere of being in the presence of someone important. Then, if this word is used in Greek, even the Jews will recognize him. John tells us in verse 7, including those who pierced him. This is a reference to a prophecy in Zechariah 12 verses 10 and Zechariah 13 verses 6, where we are told that they will look on me whom they have pierced and mourn for him as for an only son. They will grieve bitterly for him as for a firstborn son who died. They shall ask him, what are the wounds in your hands? Then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Jesus promises that the day will come when Israel will recognize their Messiah. Prophecy predicts it, and Jesus here confirms that even those who pierced him shall see him on that day. Of course, the replacement theologians stop here and do not consider the following part of verse 7. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. Replacement theology is a heresy that teaches that the church is the replacement for Israel and that many promises made to Israel in the Bible are fulfilled in the Christian church, not in Israel. 
adherents of replacement theology believe the Jews are no longer God's chosen people, and God does not have any specific future plans for the nation of Israel. Revelation 1 verses 7 is a cross-reference to Philippians chapter 2 verses 10 to 11, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. All men and women will realize, with the appearance of the Lord Jesus himself, where they have stood in relationship to him. They will mourn because they will see how scornfully they have treated him and his work for them upon the cross. Finally, in Revelation 1 verses 8, God takes the pen in his own hand and signs the book with his own signature and says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. Here he uses the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet to symbolize the beginning and the end of everything. He describes himself in this inscription as the one who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the wonderful and personal signature of God. When we read these words, we are reading a book personally autographed by the author himself. The first chapter of Revelation concludes with John's explanation of how and where he received this prophecy from God in verses 9 through to 20. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit in the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Here, in the first chapter of Revelation, we discover truth explained in the form of symbols. Jesus is described in a way that is not intended to convey his actual physical appearance, but various aspects of his character, his attributes, and his role. John received the visions on a tiny island in the Aegean Sea. This island called Patmos is only about 34 square kilometers big, located just off the coast of Turkey. John had apparently been banished to Patmos by the Romans in order to silence his preaching, hence his statement that he was there on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So John was a prisoner on Patmos. One Sunday morning, or the Lord's Day as John calls it, John was in the spirit. This does not mean that John was in some state of a religious ecstasy, but rather that he was worshipping God and meditating on God's word. Jesus described this state of mind in John 4 verses 24 when he said, God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. While John was in this worshipful attitude, a voice like a trumpet said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. On hearing this voice, John did what any of us would have done. He turned to find the source of this powerful voice. What he saw was the Lord Jesus himself standing among seven golden lampstands and holding seven stars in his hands. Here we have the important number seven again, the number of completeness and perfection. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive for evermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now look 
at each of the symbols which characterize John's vision of the Lord Jesus. Firstly, Jesus is dressed in a long robe, bound across the chest by a golden sash. This is a priestly garment and symbolizes his role as the great high priest. In scripture, gold represents the character of God. It was considered during ancient times as the noblest of all metals because it was the only incorruptible metal known to the ancient world. Only gold remains pure and untarnished, as does the character of God. This robe with its golden sash speaks of the fact that Jesus is a priest who is himself God. He is the Lord, sovereign over all of history, healing the breach between God and man. Secondly, John's description says that Jesus' head and his hair are white. White symbolizes purity, and the white head symbolizes purity of thought. These are symbols used in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, to denote the wisdom and purity of the ancient of days. A symbol among judges is white hair. In England and in some other countries, you are given a white wig with curls down to your shoulders as soon as you become a judge. An attorney gets a small white wig. The reason why it is done is because white symbolizes wisdom. Thirdly, Jesus' eyes are like blazing fire. Nothing can hide from his gaze. Fire again speaks of judgment. His feet are like bronze, glowing in a furnace. Again the symbol of the furnace-hot fires of judgment are shown by the metal bronze. Judgment is not only in our words, but also in our feet, or the way we walk. Jesus spoke truth, and his life demonstrated truth. He walked the talk. True judgment can only take place when truth is present. His voice is like the sound of rushing waters, like the roar of the surf as it dashes against the rocks, or a mighty waterfall. The sound of his voice is the sound of power. The sword which comes out of the mouth of Jesus is clearly the word of God by which Jesus reveals the truth to us. His face is like the sun shining in its strength. The brilliance of the sun symbolizes the burning intensity of truth. When John looked upon the brilliant face of the risen Lord Jesus, no doubt he remembered the time during Jesus' earthly ministry when Peter and James and himself stood together with Jesus on a high mountain in northern Israel. Here, as they prayed together, the face and the garments of the Lord Jesus were suddenly changed and shone with a whiteness like nothing ever seen on earth. This is the event which theologians call the transfiguration of Jesus, which is recorded in Matthew 17 verses 1 and 2. Peter also recalled the transfiguration in 2 Peter 1 verses 16 to 18 and told his readers that it was a preview of the future coming of Jesus. John chapter 21 records the commissioning of Peter by Jesus. He instructed Peter with the words, Feed my sheep, then prophesied that Peter would one day die a martyr's death. I deal with this in episode 10 of Journey Through the Scriptures in the podcast about Second Peter entitled The Enemy Within. At this point, Peter referred to John and said, Lord, what about this man? Peter wanted to know what sort of death was prophesied for John. And Jesus replied, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Because of a misunderstanding of this conversation between Peter and the Lord, the word went out among the disciples that John would never die until the Lord returned. But here in Revelation 1 is the explanation. John did remain alive to see the coming of the Lord. He foresaw the Lord's coming as an event in history, but he saw it in the form of a vision from God. Though history tells us that John died at the age of 90 and was buried in Ephesus, he did live to see the coming of the Lord. He saw the Lord's coming in the symbols of priestly garments, of brilliant light, of blazing fire, of thunderous sound, of supreme power, purity, wisdom and holiness. Throughout the remainder of Revelation, we will see other symbolism employed to describe various aspects of Jesus' character, power and position. In chapter 5, he will appear as a lamb and also as a lion. In chapter 19, he will appear as a rider on a great white horse. In chapter 21, he is the bridegroom coming for his bride. But it is the image of Jesus which John describes in chapter 1 that is the most startling and striking of all. 
When faced with such an overwhelming sight, John did what any human would do. He fell at the feet of Jesus as if he was dead. No one could remain standing before such a vision. This is the reaction of every human who experiences the kind of profound encounter with the living God that John experiences in Revelation 1. This is the reaction of every human who experiences the kind of profound encounter with the living God that John experiences in Revelation 1. As John lays prostrate before the feet of Jesus, the Lord does something that was so typical and characteristic of him. He reached down and touched John, placing his right hand on the beloved disciple. If we read through the Gospels, we see that Jesus was always touching people. He healed the leper by touching him. When Jesus restored sight to the blind, he put his hands upon their eyes. In Revelation 1, Jesus touches his friend John and reassures him with the words, Do not be afraid. Jesus is reassuring John that he is not his enemy. He is the first and the last and holds the keys of death and hell, the keys of both physical death and spiritual death. He is sovereign over everything, so John has nothing to fear. Having reassured John, Jesus then instructs him, Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. These are the three writing tasks that John must complete. Firstly, John is to write the things that he has seen, which is the vision that we have just examined in Revelation 1. Secondly, John is to write those things that are. That is, he is to write seven letters to seven churches about existing conditions in those churches. These letters are found in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Thirdly, John is to write about those things that are to take place after this. These are the prophetic visions of the future, found in Revelation chapters 4 through to 22. These are the three divisions of the book of Revelation, as given to us by Jesus himself. If we follow these divisions carefully, we will be able to understand God's message to us in this book that is so full of symbols, and that of course will be our goal during this series of podcasts. Do you remember God's promise in verse 3? Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. The point of the first chapter of Revelation is to focus our attention on Jesus. He is the central figure of Revelation, and all of history. Our lives can never be lived realistically, fully and joyfully without Him being central. He is the one we must take to work with us every day. He is the one who will be beside us as we drive our cars, as we go to sleep, as we face trials, and as we experience our joys. He is the source of our forgiveness when we sin, our help in time of need, and our courage, our peace, our wisdom when navigating through this broken and corrupt world. The Lord Jesus, through his servant John, has lifted the veil, the apocalypsis, from the unclear and misty future that has invited all of us to look behind the scenes of history and see the great and awesome things he is doing and is about to do upon the earth within each individual life. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 19.